Um, good evening. Thank you very much for coming. Um, it's always a somewhat artificial situation of two people who know each other well, and husband and wife, I suppose, um, <laughs> fall into that category. Um, to do an interview in, in public like this, um, uh, why should I ask her questions that I can ask her over the breakfast table? On the other hand, um, one doesn't really normally discuss a Japanese naval strategy in 1941 <laughs> over the breakfast table. So it's as good an opportunity uh, as any to, to, to discuss this a little bit uh, further. Um, one of the things that I find most interesting about the book and, and revealing and possibly for many readers in this country also, is that it tackles certain myths about Pearl Harbor. And one of the myths is, uh, which was, of course, very much encouraged uh, in the immediate post-war period, um, not only by the Japanese themselves, but also by the American um, uh, occup uh, administration, is that uh, Japan had been hijacked by the militarists, by the military, and that the civilians really were not to blame for what happened. It was a kind of militarist coup, and the Japanese people and the emperor himself were really sort of um, uh, duped by the militarists into embarking on this uh, reckless adventure. What would you say to that particular myth? That it was a very easy and convenient myth because it disengaged quite a few of the people who were actually responsible in reality and of course, for the Japanese nation as well, to think that the war could have been averted was too painful a question to, to ask, I think. And that was sort of a self-perpetuating myth that the Japanese themselves took um, very easily to after the war, after having lost so much. But in your book, you also describe why it's wrong to think of, of, of it in terms of the civilians being duped, because some of the civilian politicians, not least the Prime Minister for much of the time, Prince uh, Konoe Fumimaro, uh, was actually uh, to a large extent responsible for what happened, even though he saw that it probably would lead to a disaster. Can you, can you say something more right. about that? Right. Um, the fact that the the decision-making was, resp responsibility was shared between the civilian and the military is hard, uh, hard to sort of imagine because people just take it for granted that the military took over. But it was not the case because the leaders actually met over 70 times in the one year run up to the Pacific War and discussed uh, the alternatives and different steps to be taken and they, they, those conferences were called liaison conferences, and that was not for anything that was called that because it was, its function was to liaise civilian and military strategies and policies and create a sort of a unified voice. So civilian politicians can't really say, oh, they didn't really have any say because they did have equal say in those conferences. So why did they go along with it, even though they had great misgivings? I think it happened over a course of period in which they gradually sort of deluded themselves into thinking that, oh, we can say this much, but then some kind of diplomatic breakthrough will happen and will sort of nullify all the militaristic steps that they were taking. And when all this deliberation was going on, I think the military leaders had to put up a really bold front so that to, to preserve their face and to appease younger officers who were strategizing and thinking always about expanding their sphere of influence. And there was also an inter-service uh, rivalry. Uh, the Navy and the Army were always fighting with each other for you know, bigger budgets. And I think you know, the Navy and Army within themselves were very much divided into different cliques and sympathies. So you can't really talk about the military voice as one and monolithic. So that's another myth that, that it's has myth to be rather fact. makes mincemeat of another myth, which is that there is always tremendous consensus. 
Because on the one hand, on, on the surface, there is consensus, but actually behind the scenes, there was tremendous rivalry and differences, different factions and cliques. And, and power so bargaining and so on, yes. And what, I was trying to think, and it escapes me now, there is a Japanese expression for the top guys being driven by the middle ranking people who are more radical. It's a gekko kujo. Yes, perhaps you could explain. Um, I think the, the exact translation would be something like the uh, retainers upping the load. That, does that make sense? Maybe does that sound yes. okay as the, a translation? Yes, the, 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 the relatively, the lord who has complete authority in principle but is actually weak and is sort of driven into a more radical position by hotheads who are um, in the middle ranks. It, it sort of justifies ousting of power as well by indicting weak need leaders as ineffective, basically. So I think the younger officers throughout the 30s, especially in the beginning of the this, uh, first half of um, 1930s up to uh, February coup in 1936, I think they were really driven by this desire to, to renovate the Japanese polity and also to strengthen the imperial system and so on. And everything was done in the name of salvaging the emperor from you know, corrupt Western influences that put Japan under tremendous economic uh, strain. And you know, economic considerations cannot be separated in this period like any other part of the world. So I think there were hot-blooded officers and soldiers who were ready to mobilize, or so it was perceived by the leaders who had to be appeased. So they were in constant state of fear about what could happen to them as well. If Which they... is also, again, rather um, destroys another myth of, uh, of Japan as a sort of very authoritarian society, which on the one hand has some truth. On the other hand, the authorities were often not really uh, in control. And you mentioned the 1936 coup, which may not um, be in, immediately clear to everybody. In 1936, um, a number of middle-ranking officers, often from the Northeast, they were country boys, and the Northeast was particularly badly hit by the Depression, and that's where people were often really hungry, and the daughters had to be sa sold into prostitution and that kind of thing. And the military officers at the time, and they weren't, of course, unique in this in the world, um, believed that uh, the people responsible for this plight were the capitalists, the bankers, the elite, the establishment, and so on. And they wanted to, um, uh, they were radicals of the right and wanted to stage a coup to put the emperor, uh, to make the emperor into a kind of dictator, which he wasn't, and to sort of set up a fascist state with the emperor in the center. And even though a lot of the people, the admirals, the generals, and so on, was rather sympathetic to the aims of these young hotheads and admired their, their, their quote-unquote sincerity and so on. Um, for the, the more uh, conservative uh, members of the establishment, including the imperial household, I would have thought, they went too far. They, were, they didn't disagree with the aims necessarily, but didn't like uh, the means. And so this was a clear case of young people in the middle ranks driving uh, the people in authority um, into positions they may not have wanted to be. Right. I think the fact that the emperor was so affected by the experience of the failed coup, which nearly toppled him, is important too, because that affected his um, passiveness and perhaps diffidence in putting his foot down in 1941. And he talks about it after the war that he thought that if he tried to veto the war decision, he might be, well, Japan would have a coup d'etat of the kind that they tried in 1936, hence I didn't say anything. But that also speaks for the fact that he thought that veto was possible, which is in the Constitution not as clear as he claims. And he would have replaced the idea, would, if they could have made a case that he was badly advised, and they would have replaced him with his... One of the brothers. One of the brothers, who was, who was brothers. much more radical. Yes, popular. I mean, he was right. an army of, uh, officer, so... 
What about the other myth, which is the, the sort of the Japanese, the, the, the myth that, that the Japanese people, including the emperor, were duped by the militarists, is, one, is the sort of the, the standard mainstream.